All right, so um, tonight's list is going to be about motion FRC, mostly about the actuators that we have access to, either, you know, by the rules or just, you know, knowledge of how to use them, etc. Um, this is mostly going to be about, like, motors, and because that's the primary actuator that we use, but they're, they're also touch on solenoids and servos. Yeah, the actuators that we're allowed to use is very heavily regulated by the rules. Um, it is what section nine point six. Let me before I switch it over. Six. is there's actually like there is just a it's section nine six in the manual which that section may change year to year in the rule book but somewhere in the manual there will just be a table of here are all the electric motors you are allowed to use in the rule book um and there used to be a long time ago limits of how many of each kind of motor you can use but any lately it's just been you know, you can use however many of any motor that you want, but you are limited by power distribution panel slots. So really you're just limited to 16 motors, use whatever types of motors off of this list you want. Um, wait, actually, yeah, let me go back to that. And yeah, so there's that section, there's, you know, can't modify the motors um, except for pretty much modifying it to be able to like fit on your robot you can't try to like make the motor better than it is from the factory motor controllers to drive the motors listed here um, various things about how you have to wire them up and then just yeah, basic powering. That that is, you know, again the rule book is very important to reference when selecting a uh, actuator for the robot because it has to be legal. That they are very particular about actuators. Um. Oh yeah, I was mistaken at one point that there was a like weird rule on servo power, like saying it had to be under a certain number of watts or something. Uh, that's been changed actually as of 2020, um, which is actually a year and a half ago now, that any COTS, COTS standing for common off the shelf servo under $75 is legal. Now it has to be able to work with the RoboRio and the RoboRio can only supply a certain amount of power. So I guess Rev has a servo power, um, servo power device that's also legal, which may be of use to us, but. Yeah, it's good that servos are actually a legitimate option because before they were so restricted on how powerful they could be that they actually weren't very useful at all. I personally am not very versed on servos. That's probably a better question for uh, Coach Uladol, but they're legal and useful now, so that's good. The motors, they spin. It convert battery electric power to motion. Um, brushed or brushless, we'll get into that a little more later. Um, there's this handy website, motors.vex.com. And they have dyno information about every motor that we can use. And even some that may actually be illegal at this point. Not because they're too good. All all the best motors on this list were allowed to use, which are these three. But you can go down here. You can see like currents and powers and torques, stall torque, torque curve, power curve, efficiency curve, based on RPM and efficiency and current power, whatever, and torque. 
you can see that, you know, if you run a Falcon 500 unlimited for over 60-ish seconds, it's going to overheat and stop working because it's under uh, protection. Uh, what makes a motor band worthy? That's a good question. It's usually down to... So for a motor to be legal in FRC, there has to be supply enough for everyone to be able to have access to as many as they want. There has They have to be of a reasonable price. And, you know, they have to be compatible with our electrical system. They have to be safe. Like, you, you don't want to have high schoolers using a motor that has just built-in pinch points. You know, they also have to be um, just, like, usable in the power envelope that we have there's no sense making a motor illegal that you can't actually use all the power of without just killing the battery so so what makes a motor ban worthy is just um neo mini does have pinch points but i guess it's okay for some reason I guess it really boils down to you don't want a motor that's like any worse than that. I don't know. The first has a whitelist. They have their reasons. They don't really tell us why or why not certain things are banned. So we just kind of have to live with it. Um, but back to this. Um, yeah. So you can see like at certain current limits and it's color coded to that. Um, on a motor like the Falcon 500 or any Neo family motor, we can actually can set our own current limit in software. So this table is really handy for programmers. Why we're having a part of why we're having a uh, engineering focused discussion in the all team meeting is that software people need to know this stuff too because they they set think you you know software people have the power to set these thermal limits. Um, you can see things like uh, you can see things like the yeah. so the Falcon it looks a lot more powerful than the Neo here but again under the envelope of the FRC battery they're effectively limited to about the same power you know this was tested off of a dc power supply i'm sure you know neo 550 those are the tiny motors um these are actually the best power to weight ratio but let me get back to motors.vex.com is really handy i'll be referencing some of the information from there later but remember when you're looking at the power numbers on um, motors.vex.com power is a function of torque and rpm which is kind of better explained here about why torque isn't necessarily the Hello, best number Hopefully that video kind of helps to maybe on Vax's website a little bit more useful because, you know, the weird thing about electric motors is their, you know, torque and power curves are all pretty similar. Their power curves are all this upside down parabola and their torque curve is just a descending line, which how peak power is here is because the Torque, you know, it's RPM times torque. Thus, you end up with the parabola, not just, you know, descending line along where power descends with torque, at least until it really starts falling off up here. And, you know, for example, we run two Neos on our flywheel. We geared it such that most of our shots were actually idling the wheel at about, you know, 
in here in speed range and so that it drops down into the power band so that when the ball goes through and it knocks the speed of the flywheel down and the code says hey we need more speed to launch this power cell it has all of its power available to get it back up to speed now the battery doesn't like that very much but you know the battery can deal with it Yeah, and then you can see down here, these are just some equations that show you that, you know, you can actually rate one of our robot drive trains in uh, horsepower. Um, if we were using all Falcon 500s, it'd be about six. We're using Neo, so it's like five, five-ish, somewhere in there. So, you know, if, Someone asked how many, how powerful is our robot? Um, you know, Neo is 516 watts times six. You could tell them that it's 3,096 watts or 5.7 or about 4.151 uh, horsepower. So the big three motors that we'll hopefully deal with the most are um, the three brushless ones. And we'll get to why that would be. We'll probably definitely end up using some brushed motors, but for anything that's super important, we'll probably use brushless motors. So the Neo 550, um, it has sizing and mounting based on the RS 550, which is a old uh, brush DC motor that we used a lot that's kind of been phased out at this point but all the old gearboxes and transmission and mounting points designed for that work for the Neo 550. This is the Spark Max motor controller which is interchangeable with the Neo motor controller. You know these two from Rev use the same motor controller and you can you know reuse parts between deployments of a brushless motor. Um, Neo 550 is tiny. You guys have seen our intake. It's that little tiny motor that's on that. Um, so it's useful for anything that's tightly packaged, light duty. You don't want to stall these a bunch. They don't have a ton of thermal mass. They will overheat. But they can supply about 200 watts of power for our match duration. So even if we have something that's running just straight up constantly, if we current limit it right, it can supply 200 watts for the entire match, which that's all about all a uh, 775 Pro down here can do anyway. So for the size and the weight, I'd rather take a Neo 550 and current limit it than use this because it's heavier, they're more prone, at least as far as we know, more prone to failure, etc. Um, it's 42 CPR encoder, but it goes really fast, so PID control is less of an issue. It's also just less likely to be on something that needs a PID. PID is for the engineers, is how the control, the, uh, control team makes things have presets, is how succinctly I can put it. Um, Anyway, so that's Neo 550. They're a pretty good motor. They're the best power to weight ratio motor we've got. But, you know, that doesn't mean it's the best thing for everything. I would never, ever put a Neo 550 on a drive drivetrain unless we had a very low gear that we could go to just in case. Neo. Uh, sizing and mounting based on the classic sim motor. Sim motor is like we have a locker full of these sim motors. They're these big, heavy, three pound things. And the sim used to be the motor in FRC. And I mean the motor. Most powerful. Every robot probably had five, six of them. But, you know, recently they've kind of. They're, they're still competitive and you can still win regionals with sims, but. If you have the option to use something better, do it. Um, 
Yeah, sizing mounting is based on the classic SIM motor. So again, we can use all the old SIM based gearboxes with a Neo or a Falcon 500, but we'll get to that. I'm going to call them good for dumb muscle. The, they have an internal encoder, which is only 42 counts per rev. Means we can't get quite as accurate control over them as we could other options. But they're very powerful. Also, the Spark Max has the problem where it only runs a PID at 50 times per second, which our old uh, Talon SRX controllers and the um, whatever the name is of the integrated controller on the Falcon 500 runs at a thousand times per second with a better encoder. These are what I'd recommend for anything precise. These are more, they're a good conveyor motor or like an intake motor or a lift motor. Maybe not flywheel or drivetrain because our drivetrain requires a lot of precision. The motor and controller weighs about 1.2 pounds. Oh yeah, I didn't cover on the you know, 550. Motor controller is only five point, is a little over half a pound. And you know, remember we have a 125 pound limit for the whole robot. Uh, yeah, they can sustain about 350 watts for the whole match of output, constant output without overheating. Falcon 500, they're also a SIM based motor have an integrated motor controller. So if the motor goes out, you have to throw away the motor controller with it. That's kind of a downside of them. But to be fair, the Neo also has a downside of it's got an integrated encoder cable that's kind of annoying to deal with. So that also junks the motor, but at least when the motor dies, it's only like a $40 cost. These things are like 140 bucks, which, you know, Buying new is competitive with the Spark Max and the controller for this and the motor. But, you know, replacing motors is a little bit more costly on the Falcon 500 side. So yeah, it's got, it's got the better motor controller. It's got the better encoder in it. Its PIDs run faster. It's like a tenth of a pound lighter. But also it doesn't use a standard SIM output shaft, so we'd have to buy some new pinions for it. We actually don't have any of these Falcon 500s on hand at the shop, which is, you know, not great, but we'll get there eventually. So yeah, gearbox options. The Neo 550 has this sweet little ultra planetary gearbox it can use. It's plastic and it can't take the load of the Versa planetary, but for like an intake, it seems like it's, you know, the gearbox to use because it's just so light and small. And then down here we have what I'd call SIM-based gearboxes. We've got Vex Pro Ball Shifter, um, West Coast Products Dual Speed Gearbox, the uh, Andy Mark Tough Box Mini, and the Andy Mark Classic Tough Box. These are hardly relevant anymore. You'll see these a lot on our older robots, but anymore we tend to stay away from them because they're just so heavy. But yeah, so all these down here are for what you'd use for a Neo or a Falcon 500 or a SIM base motor. Um, and there's many other gearboxes around, especially for SIM based stuff. But, you know, these are the ones you'll see a lot. Why brushless? Uh, efficiency is the big thing. So according to the VEX motor testing, Falcon 500 at max power is delivering 50% efficiency, um, 87% has the capability of delivering 80%, ah, 87% at max efficiency, which for max efficiency is very high in the uh, rev range for all these motors. You know, you're on, almost at their uh, free speeds that they just naturally go to. Compare that to the old SIM that at max power, it's 41% efficient and 65% uh, efficient at max efficiency. This is just due to it being, you know, an older brush design where you have physical contact between the brushes and the stator or the armature. And also, or, or the commentary, 
The main thing is that there's physical contact there, which adds a little bit of drag. Also that the uh, Sim actually doesn't use a bearing, it uses a bushing to support the uh, motor shaft. So not only are they a little bit less efficient out of the box, they wear out. Now they'll run in a wear worn out state forever, but that the amount of time that a Sim is like new and nice and running at its best as it would be tested is very short. So these numbers are a Sim on a good day and they get worse from there. The uh, brushless motor, as you can see from this animation here, there's no contact. They don't really degrade as much as a brushed motor. And so you get a lot more consistent, uh, you know, performance out of them. So, you know, the numbers are better to begin with and they stay better. You know, two, uh, Team 254, they've won Worlds, I think, four times now. It, they're, they're, they're ridiculous. They're really good. They will throw, they will consider a sim worthless after it's run one event. And so, you know, we don't do that. We run them forever because we're, we don't have that kind of money. But, you know, the fact that they're noticeable enough to do, for a team to replace them is probably not a good sign that they're the motor to use on a competition robot. They're great for just prototyping around the shop, but they're also just really heavy. 775 variant motors are notorious for letting out the magic smoke. Like, they're very, very easy to smoke because they're... They kind of have the Neo 550 problem where they don't have a lot of thermal mass, but they don't have a motor controller that's smart enough to know when it's overheating and, you know, stop running it so hard. So a 775 Pro is just very easy to destroy. Like, Plus we have to manually solder the motor terminals on and it's very easy to get them backwards without having a standard for that. So yeah, the 7 and the 7, 7.5 Pro are relevant brushless brushed motors, but their power to weight isn't great. The, you know, the efficiency is not there. And as we're pushing our you know battery to the limit, efficiency is king in FRC right now. So you know, I was mentioning a lot of gearboxes back there and. Uh, in the engineering explained video kind of well explained it a bit ago, but you know, a three to one gear ratio multiplies your torque by three and divides your speed by three. A lot of the uh, free speeds on the motors are very quick. Like, if we go back to the motor that you know, we're looking at the Falcon 500 runs at 6300 RPM, Neo 5880, Neo 550 is 11,000 RPM, bag motor 13,000. 775 Pro makes runs at 18,000 RPM at top speed. It just makes less power because of, you know, a lot less torque than a Neo 550. Which means that we need to gear them down either with pulleys or sprockets. And a 3 to 1 is referring to like either gear teeth, sprocket teeth, or pulley teeth slash size, depending on whether you're using a timed or a flat pulley. Gear Gearboxes are usually there because they're a lot more compact. Um, because packaging on first FRC robots is also very important. So what you'll see a lot is we'll have a gear ratio to get like most of the reduction we need and then like a pulley or sprocket to get that final adjustment because it's a lot easier to adjust a pulley and a sprocket rather than changing out a gear set to adjust gear ratios so we'll get we'll get really close with gearbox and then use a pulley and a sprocket to get you know right where we want The cool thing that I we actually have not used on this team before, but I'm going to highly advocate for it is the highlight gear or drivetrain simulator. You know, we have to pick a gear ratio for our drivetrain based on how many motors are on it and uh, 
the distance that our cycles are going to take. So this is the iLight drivetrain simulator, and I punched in some numbers for our robot. You know, we run a six Neo drive, and our cycle distance from the feeder station to the uh, goal is about 50 feet. You can see it down here. Oh yeah, I put in the robot weight. Auxiliary weight is the weight that isn't counted toward inspection, your batteries and bumpers. You know, bat battery voltage things. And I put in our gear ratios. And this says that our robot should be able to get across the field as is in 4.6 seconds, including slowdown time to stop at the goal. Which, you know, I was interested to see, you know, a lot of teams only run four motors on their drive, and I wanted to see how much is that really helping us in a cross-field sprint. Well, it's helping us about two-tenths of a second per, per cycle just by adding those two motors, which I, I guess maybe isn't a just in that case. Because, you know, the gearbox engineering to do that was actually kind of difficult. But... Funnily enough, if we were to swap out to um, Falcon 500s, they wouldn't really help with four motors, but if we go to six Falcon 500s, which would be ridiculous, we could run across the field in 4.4 seconds. Coach Bargeman is already typing in chat that we can't afford six Falcon 500s. I guarantee it. But, um, yeah, but also it gives you uh, good information about, put it back to our actual motor configuration, about, um, so there's this gear spread because we have a low gear, and it actually shows that we have the same amount of pushing force in either gear because we're traction limited, And, you know, it shows our speed in feet per second. But what it also shows is that when we're putting out our max uh, traction force, in low gear, we're only putting about 139 amps of load on the battery, which is actually really close to our um, breaker, our main breaker spec, which means we could probably push someone around for an entire match without worrying about popping the breaker. But in high gear, we'd probably pop the breaker in like 30 seconds, somewhere around there. Oh yeah, and it also models how, uh, how oddly enough, um, dropping down to four Neos actually makes our battery usage worse. Sure, we could push longer in high gear, but notice how our attractive force in high gear goes way down. Yeah, I, I I thought the same thing, Coach. And I I was I was looking at that because I wanted to, uh, which is really bad engineering practice. But I wanted to be able to justify taking two motors off. But looking at it, it's actually just more efficient to use six motors. It's extra weight, but you know that. At the same time, use, using less battery and going faster sounds like a good trade-off for a couple pounds to me. So yeah, this is a very good tool you can set in, you know, sprint distance. Say we were only going, you know, 10 feet. Look, our gear ratio is terrible if we're designed to only go 10 feet. Which I would expect because we geared it to run clear across the field or at least halfway across the field, or like 25, which would be field side to field side is, yeah. Oh yeah, and the can turn is useful. You, you don't want to select a gear ratio that makes your robot unable to turn. So keep an eye on that when you're setting these. So yeah, but yeah, I like drivetrain simulator, use it. Exactly, Coach Parchman. We can wait. 
weigh the pros and cons of it. As we are now, you know, we don't have a, a climber, so we're going to have to, if we have any hope of doing well at Cowtown, we're going to have to cycle like mad. So that, that two-tenths of a second might actually be worth something. Um, yeah. Let me put PowerPoint. So yeah, that's just for drivetrains. There's, um... In our design tool, we'll have calculators for other mechanisms. How you usually set it is you just try to optimize um, a battery usage, but also, you know, time to perform a task. Either, you know, get an elevator to a certain height or intake. Um, oh yeah. And for the purposes of our calculations, pulleys and sprocket reductions, are effectively the same as gears, treat it like an extra sandwich reduction. Oh yeah, I actually want to go back to the eye light thing really quick because I forgot something. It also says here, um, takes into account the efficiency losses of having multiple stages. Um, if I take the ratio spread out, or... well, okay. I forget the control to do it, but, um, you, they actually estimate that you lose about 3% efficiency by adding a uh, shifting drivetrain. So that's another thing that we need to weigh is, do we want to give up that efficiency for having a low gear? And also the weight penalty for having, you know, multiple gears on your gearboxes, the space penalty. So there's a lot that can be learned from this. It's a very good tool that we should use once again. So yeah, so intake. Uh, rule of thumb is you want you want to figure out your drivetrain speed for your optimal you know optimal uh, cycle running, but, and then you want to make your intake run at double that speed at the wheels in feet per second. Um, flywheel. Variable tuning. Everything else, there's something in the design tool to tune with. So, speaking of that, let me get that pulled up. I want to run through the design tool really quick. This is going to be a spreadsheet that's going to be very useful for us, hopefully, this year. Um, what I'll do is I'll Onshape has the ability to link documents in your design tabs. And so I will just embed this in on shape. There's calculators in here to figure out how many air tanks you need to actuate some solenoids and cylinders a certain number of times per match without running the compressor. There are drivetrain calculators in here, and I would suggest that we, after we figure out what we want in the iLight simulator, we add a tab in here to document what we picked so that we can reference it later. Then there's also, you know, intake calculators to figure out gear ratios for intake. Here is our actual outer intake. It says we're running at 408.4 inches per second at a 3 to 1 gear ratio. And it only pulls like 62 amps when it falls, or which is actually not that bad. Bottom conveyor. Oh, yeah. Bottom conveyor. Shows that uh, it's a bit too slow, to be real honest. And we should have geared that higher. Which is actually something that we may revisit, because if we put the rollers on tomorrow, and it, the system isn't dragging as bad, we probably need to gear up our conveyors. Don't let us forget that. Linear, this would be for like an elevator. Um, we don't have anything on the robot that's like an elevator right now. So, yeah. Um, rotary. I think that would be like a uh, flywheel or something. Other calculators in here is like center to center distances for 25 chain. You can calculate them right in here. What I do is when you calculate that, you go down here and do to go to duplicate, then rename to like. Drive train chain spacing. 
to figure out, you know, how far apart the holes need to be to be an even number of chain links so that we don't have to run tensioners. And then number 35 chain, which 35 chain is just a thicker chain. It can handle more load. And then three mil and five mil belt, same idea. Calculators in here. And as we get more motors, we can actually add in the motor data so that to be used in the other calculators. So the design tool is really super handy. Remember that it exists and use it. Another spreadsheet that's also useful is the parts tracking simulator. We can keep track of, you know, who all our machinists are, what they're working on, what's what's currently being worked on, who's designing what. Um, we can generate parts numbers for the different assemblies and stuff that we'll make. So you can like, you know, put in, you know, designers, you know, the machine that it uses. And, you know, I think this will be important because it forces people to take ownership as the, to, to, as the designer of a part. We've had problems in years past where, you know, we say repeatedly, X needs done and no one steps up and does it. If it's sitting in here, but well, and then at the same time, people are sitting around, you know, playing ping pong because they say they don't have anything to do. If we log it in here as a thing that needs to be done, then, you know, people don't have the excuse of, I don't know what to do. I don't have anything to do. You know, now they might have the, ex the excuse of, I don't know how to do this, but at that point you should take ownership and then just ask, you know, a mentor how to, how to or even a fellow student, how to do it. So this will be big in the upcoming season, hopefully. But, you know, you can put your assembly names, status, keep track of weights of things, you know, et cetera. Um, and then... But yeah, and I know it says 1806 on the spreadsheet name, but those actually came from 1678. Um, and yeah, I'll make blank versions for the new robots. But uh, in the slide deck, I've linked those sandboxes, and you can feel free to play around in there and see what it's like to use as a tool. So the pneumatic cylinders. Uh, air goes on one side, pushes it out. Air goes on the other side, pulls it back in. Um, there's just some common suppliers. I'm not even going to bother reading them out loud because, well... Yeah, you can read. Uh, so the force that a cylinder can apply is the area relating to the bore times pressure. So like this example, a three quarter inch bore cylinder running at our legal limit 60 PSI can push with about 141 pounds of force. So, you know. Also, you know, keep in mind, I think I talked about this in another lesson, but the compressor is only about 50% efficient uh, at best. So they're, you know, it's really not the most efficient way to get power on the robot. Now, we can charge it up before the match and then switch the battery, which means it's extra power available. and but it is they are kind of heavy and inefficient. Servos. We, I don't know if there's ever been a recent time where we've used a servo on the robot, but the rules just recently loosened up on these, so we may look into using servos. Um, you know, they have built-in angle control on them, which is nice. So anything that's like simple, you just need to go between a few angle presets um, or angel presets because there's a typo on this Amazon listing. Supposedly this thing can deliver like 25 kilograms of force or something. Let me see. 
Well, some some of those I was seeing say that they can they have like twenty five kilograms of torque, which is quite a bit. I doubt it, but that's quite a bit. Yeah, servos exist. They're good to use if we need them because if we only have like one pneumatic thing on the robot, we might look into replacing it with a servo just to get rid of the whole pneumatic system just for weight and simplicity. So another actuator that it's kind of regulated by the rules, but not as much is that um, you can make a mechanism that's spring loaded and have your energy come from that instead of the battery. For example, this is Team 1114's climber from the 2013 season. A, it's just really cool, and B, that is, when it goes up, that is spring loaded. So it spring loads out, and then they pull in with the uh, motors. And then they score in the top of the goal because they're cool. So yeah, using spring load, especially for something like a climber to go to bring the climber out and then winch down. Totally valid, totally a good idea. Very much something we're allowed to do and should take advantage of. Other than that, um, um, I'm actually out of material for this evening, so uh, I'll stick around for questions and then we can call it an evening. Okay, since you guys don't have questions, I guess I'll maybe ask some. Um, so what motors are we actually using on our drivetrain? That is actually incorrect. And so the Neo 550 is what we're using on our intake. And they're both Neo motors, so I could see where you'd get uh, confused there. But it's just the base Neo, not the Neo 550. The Neo 550 belongs nowhere near the drivetrain. Yep, uh, it understandable. It happens. Uh, let's see. So what tool should you use to determine um, what a drivetrain gearing should be? I like, yep, yep, you're all right. That is correct. Um, is the sim motor brushed or brushless?
Oh, and it's drive train, not drive terrain. But I, I could see where they would get mixed up. Yep, it is a brush motor. Brush DC motor. Well, I... That proves to me that you guys at least mostly paid attention, so thanks for being here. Um, thanks for paying attention. I know it's... I mean... I know we don't like to be in the shop actually messing with stuff, but this information is important and stuff that we're going to use next year. And, you know, the, the idea is we teach you all this stuff and then we go qualify for Worlds next year, which extends the amount of time that we can mess around with robots in the shop. So I think that's all for tonight. Uh, thanks for coming and I'll see you all tomorrow.